Well, good morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning teaching. We are currently in the book of Daniel. And uh, I titled this Daniel's Prayer, Repentance, and Questions. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 9. So if you have your Bible, smartphones, iPad, computer, whatever you might have. Daniel chapter 9 is what we're going to get into this morning. Let's pray. Father, again, we come before you. <clears throat> we thank you for your word, because in your word there is life. There's life for us as believers. I pray for those who are watching. If they don't know you, if they haven't given their lives to you, Lord, I pray, Father, that they would come to know you as Lord and Savior, that they would ask for repentance of their forgiveness rather of their sins, that they would repent. And God, that you would write their name in the book of life. And God, that, that, that they would become born again believers in you, Lord, and now be your sons and daughters. Lord, I pray for a special blessing and a special anointing on your word. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. So as we begin chapter nine, we get a look at Daniel's prayer. We're going to look at his prophecy regarding how the end times will come together. It all ties in with the time we're living in right now and the book of Revelation as we're studying on Wednesday evenings. The first 21 verses give us Daniel's prayer. The last six verses give us the prophecy of the 70 weeks. Now, I split up the teaching. We're going to look at the first 19 verses. I want to focus on the emphasis of prayer, Daniel's prayer. Next Sunday, I want to get into uh, verses 20 to 27 and the 70 weeks of Daniel. I want to make it so plain and clear in the interpretation for you that you could tell others and teach those verses to others because it all ties in with what's going to happen with what's just before us. We know the church is going to be removed before the Antichrist can be revealed. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul makes that extremely clear to <clears throat> the church of Thessalonica. So next week, 70 weeks of Daniel. Daniel's prayer is a culmination of a life of prayer. The, the guy prayed, man. He was a prayer warrior. Well, here he gives us the pattern of his life in praying. And so if you're taking notes, you can write these things down. Number one, Daniel had a purpose in praying. He had a purpose in praying. In verse three, it says, then I set my face towards the Lord God to make a request by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. He had a purpose in praying. You see, for Daniel, prayer wasn't just a repetition of a bunch of words like you can hear people run off today. Somebody said, I don't know who said this, but I, I think it's pretty clever. Some men's prayers need to be cut short on both ends and lit on fire in the middle. Amen. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 7, and when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. There it is. Secondly, sometimes it's uncomfortable to spend time in prayer. Sometimes it's uncomfortable to spend time in prayer. Again, Daniel prayed with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Sackcloth and ashes was a form of repentance in the Old Testament. It wasn't for an outward show. It was to reveal the sincerity of his heart before God, the sincerity of his heart. Third, he was straight up in his confession to God. He was straight up in his confession to God. Now, no doubt he remembered what was written in the law. Leviticus chapter 26, verses 40 to 42. This is what laid the foundation for Daniel's prayer. Listen to what it says. But if they confess their inequity and the inequity of their fathers, 
with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me and that they also have walked contrary to me. Man, does that ring a bell with so many people today? They're unfaithful to God. They're walking just the opposite of what God wants them to walk. And that I also have walked contrary to them. Notice what God says. They walk contrary to me. Now I'm walking contrary to them. And have brought them into the land of their enemies. Wow. If their uncircumcised hearts are humble and they accept their guilt, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham. I will remember, I will remember the land. For because he had a life of prayer, <clears throat> his prayers were powerful, man. They were powerful. I find it interesting. Daniel received an answer while he was still praying. I mean, the dude wasn't even done praying. And boom, here's the answer. <laughs> I love it. When, don't you wish God would do that all the time? Gabriel, who is an archangel, appeared to Daniel to explain what was going on. We read in 1 John 5, verse 14. Now, this is the confidence that we have in God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. You get that? The fifth one, he prayed for himself and in private. Daniel didn't call a public prayer meeting. The guy prayed privately. Often in scripture, we see the Lord prayed privately privately. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can see Jesus would go up to a deserted place all by himself, sometimes pray all night, man. He would get up off of his knees and begin the day ministering to the people for another day. That was Jesus' life. Six, Daniel prayed knowing God was listening. When you pray, do you believe God is listening? Hebrews 4.16 tells us, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There it is. Prayer for Daniel was a real deal. It was a real deal. It required effort. It required endurance. It required suffering. It's all part of it. Look at verse one as we pick up our study here. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of the reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. So let me kind of break this down for you. The first year of Darius was 539 BC. It was the year Babylon fell to the Medes and the Persians. Now, this didn't catch Daniel by surprise. I want you to understand this. God had already told Daniel the Medo-Persian empire would conquer Babylon. Where? Where does it say that, Rick? <laughs> In Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the great image, the head of gold would be replaced by the chest and arms of silver in chapter two, the Medes and the Persians. Later visions revealed the bear would conquer the lion in chapter seven. The thing that intrigued Daniel was the future. Isn't that what intrigues us as Christians today? The future especially the future of Daniel's people, the Jewish people. So Daniel turns to studying God's word. Wow, what a mind blower, huh? He looks to God's word to know what the future is all about. He reads a book of the prophet Jeremiah, who said Israel would be in captivity for 70 years. Jeremiah the prophet said that. The date is about 537 BC right now. Daniel is somewhere between 85 and 90 years old. Remember, 
He was captured in 606 BC when he was about 17 years old. So that means the 70 year period is coming to a close. Daniel understands this. Daniel was a little blown away by that little horn in chapter eight we studied last time. Antiochus Epiphanes, the Syrian king of the Seleucid dynasty. Now we understand that Antiochus abused Daniel's people, the Jewish people. He also desecrated the temple. But I want you to take special notice to what brought Daniel to this prayer. It was his study of God's word. Exactly what we are doing this morning. We are studying God's word. Why, why would Daniel study God's word? Well, you ready for this? It's God's word that reveals God's will. <laughs> when you go to make a decision, and if you're gonna seek God on it, God will show you the will in that decision if it's gonna backfire in your face down the road, or if this is what he's setting up for you. I wanna be in his will. I've fallen on my face too many times through the years because I just made a decision like off the top of my head, this is what I'm gonna do instead of seeking God. <clears throat> if you wanna know God's will, you have to study his word, followed up by prayer. God revealed to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 25, verses 11 to 12, and Jeremiah 29, verse 10, that his people would be taken to Babylon and exiled from their land for 70 years. 70 years. The reason for God's exile of the Jewish people was because God had commanded his people to give the land a Sabbath rest every seven years. And a year of Jubilee every 50 years. We read in Leviticus 25. The 49th and 50th years would be sabbatical years. That's when the people were not allowed to sow seed and cultivate their fields. Well, what God intended to do was to make the people put their trust in him. For their food to grow, and to meet their daily needs. That's what it was all about. The law was good for the land. It helped to restore its fertility, but it was also good for the spiritual life of the Jewish people. The spiritual life of the Jewish people. That's why we gotta be obedient. You want life? You want good spiritual life? You want blessings from God or you want his cursings? You get to make the choice. You want his cursings? Be unfaithful to them. Put them out of the picture. Let me know how that goes for you. As history has it, it wasn't until Israel's captivity in Babylon did the land finally enjoy its Sabbath rest. Yeah, you bet, 70 years of Sabbath rest. We read in 2 Chronicles <clears throat> chapter 36, verse 20 to 21, and those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. <clears throat> God's word backs up and supports God's word. This is what I love about it. Notice the promises Daniel read in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 25, 11, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Jeremiah 29, 10, For thus says the Lord, After 70 years are completed at Babylon, I, God, will visit you and perform my good towards you and cause you to return to this place. Look at verse three. Daniel says, and I set my face towards the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, <clears throat> sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, 
who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. Man, there's the key. There it is in a nutshell. You gotta love the Lord. You gotta keep his commandments. Daniel mentions fasting. Now we know Jesus fasted, but fasting was never given to God's people as a service. It was something someone could do over and above what was required. In reading the book of Acts, many of in the early church fasted. An example is Paul the apostle. He wrote in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 27, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. I mean, that brother went through some trips, man. <laughs> I bet he had a hit trip just about every day. It's radical. Daniel not only prepared himself for prayer, he worshiped the Lord. He confessed his sin and he asked for mercy for his people, Israel, the Jewish people. Daniel's on his face before God. He recognized God's attributes. <clears throat> Number one, his omniscience. That means God knows all things. He's all knowing. Secondly, his omnipotence. That means God has no bounds or limitations. He can do anything, man. Thirdly, his omnipresence. God is everywhere at all times. Fourth, he's eternal. God has no beginning. God has no end. We see his personal relationship with God. He calls him my God. Do you do that today? Do you call the Father my God? He makes his confession dwelling on God's greatness. Daniel knows God keeps his covenant. He knows God keeps his mercy to them who love him. Daniel knew that. God makes promises and he keeps them. God is a faithful God of mercy. It was by God's mercy Israel had been preserved. It's by God's mercy that you and I have been brought to this very time in history of mankind at the end of the church dispensation. It's by God's mercy. He saves us and he allows us to go to heaven. You don't have to allow us to go to heaven. You wanna to go to hell? Do your own thing. Do your own thing. Be unfaithful to God. Make your own choices and decisions. Leave God out of the picture and you can go to hell and spend all eternity in total isolation, darkness, pitch black, in horrific pain with no one around you and not a chance to ever, ever come out of hell. You want that? Do your own thing. Do your own thing apart from God. Notice Daniel's confession of sin in verse five. <clears throat> he says, we have sinned and committed inequity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. Here Daniel identifies himself with his people in Israel when they were rebelling against God. You know anybody rebelling against God today? Pray for him, man, because you and your prayer is the only hope that they have. It's the only hope they have. It resulted in their captivity. God allowed them to go into captivity. They want to do their own thing? Okay, I'll let you do your own thing. Let me have someone rule over you. Second Chronicles 36, verse 15 and 16. Daniel is specific in his confession and in speaking of sin. Notice what he says. Inequity, which is sin. Wickedness, rebellion, disobedience, and refusal to hear God's word. Refusal to hear God's word. It brought judgment on them. There it is. Our confession of sin isn't enough to go to God and say, I've sinned. It means telling God what we've done, coming to him in confession. Look at verse seven. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face as it is this day. To the men of Judah, 
to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in all countries to which you have driven them. You want to be disobedient? Look what God will do. He'll drive you out because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you, against God. Guys, this is heavy drama, man. It's heavy stuff. You got to take this seriously. Israel was scattered. Some were near Daniel and Babylon. Others were so far away. And it was brought about because of their unfaithfulness to God. It's what happens. You know, if you're with a group of believers and you become unfaithful, do you know that God will separate you from the other believers? He will do that because he doesn't want the unfaithfulness to enter into the other believers. He'll separate you and he'll send you far away. That's how it works. Look at verse eight. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against you. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law, of Moses, a servant of God, has been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. Here it is, man. It can't get any clearer. For under the whole heaven, such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our sin and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. Notice how Daniel brought out the difference between God's goodness with Israel's sin. The people were scattered because of their trespass against God. They deserved the punishment they received because God was righteous in sending them into captivity. If you go to God and you make excuses for your sin, you are actually literally blaming your sin on God. That's what you're doing. You're making excuses for your sin. You're blaming your sin on God. You get what you deserve, man. We get what we deserve. We need to go to God and confess our sin. Daniel's attitude is the right attitude. We should take as we approach our Heavenly Father in prayer. You see, God's not going to move on our behalf until we claim God's mercy and we stop making excuses for ourselves. He's not going to move on our behalf. We're on our own. And when you decide to be unfaithful and do your own thing, you lose that covering of protection over you. God's covering of protection over you, you lose that. And now you're vulnerable and you're on your own, baby. You are on your own. Look at verse 15. <clears throat> and now our Lord, O oh God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O oh Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the inequities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Notice what happens. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear. <clears throat> Open your eyes. See our desolations and the city which is called by your name, Jerusalem. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. 
God led Israel out of Egypt because of his righteousness. It wasn't because of the Jewish people's righteousness. Exodus 2 verse 24 and 25 says, So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and Jacob, and God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. It was his righteousness. The only thing that made an appeal to God from the people was their groaning. God saw their misery and God remembered his mercy. The leaders and people knew the terms of God's covenant. They knew it. How many of us know the Bible today? How many of us know how we need to be living for God? But they deliberately violated them. Man, you are in some bad, bad, bad bandini if you're violating God's word. You have no clue what is ahead of you, man. You have, I am so sorry for you. I feel for you, man. I'll pray for you if this is where you are today. They were unfaithful to God's covenant, but God was faithful to keep his word. If they had only obeyed God's word and stayed with him, God would have been faithful to bless them. He would have given them the desires of their heart if they would have stayed faithful to him and obeyed his word. It's sad. Psalm 81, verse 11 to 16. Listen to what God says. But my people who would not heed my voice and Israel would not have any of me. So I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord would pretend submission to him, but their fate would endure forever. He would have fed them also with the finest of wheat and with honey from the rock, I would have satisfied you. You see, because they rebelled, God was faithful to chasten them. But there's something even worse than the sins that brought God's punishment to Israel. It was a refusal to repent. <clears throat> it was a refusal to confess their sin, even after being taken captive. Hard hearts. They spent their time praying for judgment against Babylon. Duh! Instead of seeking God's face and asking for God's forgiveness. Verse 19, O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Here Daniel is asking God to hear and answer because of who he is and what he has promised. Who God is and what God has promised. God's name is at stake. Daniel is concerned about God's name and God's glory. Well, we know God answered Daniel's prayer. In the very next year, Cyrus issued a decree that allowed the Jews to return to their land, take the temple treasures with them, rebuild the temple, and restore the worship. I love it, man. All because they repented and got right with God and got back to where they needed to be. Daniel was counselor to four different kings. He lived a long life, man. He was intercessor for the people. He was faithful witness to the true and living God. And he was the author of one of the greatest books of prophecy in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Daniel had already learned from the visions God gave him that tough times were ahead for God's people with a kingdom to appear that would crush everything good and promote everything evil. That's what we're going to look at next time. We're going to look at the 70th week of Daniel. The 70th week is the great tribulation period, a kingdom that would crush everything and promote everything evil. First, Daniel's asking, would God's people survive? Second, Daniel asks, when will the promised Messiah, Messiah appear? Third, Daniel's asking, would God's kingdom be established on earth? Well, 
Daniel is going to receive the answers to those questions next week. Stay tuned. Verses 20 to 27, the prophecy of the 70 weeks of Daniel. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the things you continue to teach us, Lord. God, we want to know your word so that we can conduct our lives accordingly. Those who aren't in the word, those who aren't in getting taught, their heart gets harder and harder and harder as every day goes by until they come to the place when they're not even sensitive to the Holy Spirit speaking to them. At that point, they are totally left on their own. God, I pray for those in that place. Lord, I pray whatever it takes, turn them around, God. Even if it means their life, I would rather have them with us for all eternity than to die in their sin and somehow end up in the lake of fire and brimstone for all eternity. That's the reality of this. Father, go before us now. Bless the rest of this day as we lift this brand new week up to you, Father. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you guys. I love you. Lord willing, I'll see you Wednesday or I'll see you in the air. Man, I'm listening. I am listening for that trumpet to sound. Are you guys ready? <laughs> Let's do this, Lord. Let's do it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.